Top Bird Talk. Monty Mython here. As we prepare to move into the next phase of the COVID crisis, we're going to be widening our focus here on Top Bird Talk. We will continue to deliver COVID-specific programmes, but we all have a huge additional responsibility as we try to reboot normal services. So although this piece is not directly related to COVID-19, we believe it's information that is crucial to the bigger task of rebuilding the healthcare system as we learn to adapt and live with this new virus. Thank you to our sponsors and to you, our listeners, for helping us to share this important information. Simon Davies uh, from York Teaching Hospital uh, Trust, NHS Foundation Trust. So Simon's going to talk to us about uh, how to treat that blood pressure. Thank you. Tim showed us how blood pressure is associated, or low blood pressure, with poor outcomes for our patients. And the pokey guidance now says, right, keep that blood pressure probably above 65, 70 millimeters of mercury. And so the next question is really, how do we do that? How's the best way to, first of all, avoid hypotension? Uh, We can't avoid it. How do we treat it properly? Um, Disclosures for this talk, I am a pay consultant for Edwards Life Sciences, and I will talk about one of their products. How can we best avoid hypotension, first of all? And these are my ideas, if it works. Uh, First of all, we could just be a bit better. That includes myself as well. And we'll have a look at some of the data that Tim showed you, just to show you the instance of hypotension. We could just measure it a bit more. We're still using Victorian technology as our mainstay for the measurement of blood pressure. We could potentially treat it before it happens, and this is quite exciting. The role of predictive analytics in determining whether a patient will become hypotensive in the future. And maybe actually what we should do is let somebody else or something else treat it for us. Because let's face it, our history on this, it's not very good. We don't do it very well. In terms of treating blood pressure, that's another problem as well. We're a little bit paralysed by the amount of information that we have to make rational decisions as to the underlying cause of hypertension and whether the treatment we're going to use will have the right effect. So first of all, why do we need to be a little bit better? And this is the same um, study that Tim showed you in the last talk. Um, it's 15,000 patients, retrospective. Very simply, they just capture the instance and duration of blood pressure. And if we look at relative extremes that I you know intuitively we know aren't good for patients, so a drop in our blood pressure by 40%, either systolic or MAP, half of patients have this for one minute. And you know what? I can buy that. We're all a bit heavy handed with a propofol sometimes, regional anesthesia, clamps come off, but low BP for a minute, we treat it. Okay, that's probably unavoidable hypotension. But 25% of patients had this level of hypotension for 10 minutes or more. So we've halved the blood pressure and we've let it happen for 10 minutes. That is not unavoidable hypotension. That is just not treating it. Okay? And that becomes our fault. And as Tim was saying, you know, most or a third of hypotension is from induction of anesthesia to finding the surgeon in the coffee room. You know, we, we are culpable for this amount of um, low blood pressure. And it causes harm and that's what we forget. But you know, this was 12 years ago. We are progressive, we are educated, and we change. We roll with the time. So that does not reflect what we do now. Only it turns out it does. Okay. It's randomly picked this, not because of the instance of hypertension. It just reinforces what we already know. This is from the NHS or from the, the, well, the, the sprint audit of practice from the hip fracture database. Now, we've jumped forward from 2007 now to 2015. The yellow bars, or the green bars rather, the study I've just shown you, the blue bars from the fracture database. There is almost no difference. The instance of hypotension hasn't really changed over a decade. Strikingly similar. And the real message is there is still lots of it. These are the three sort of landmark studies that uh, really fed into the POCI um, guidance to keep the blood pressure above 65 to 70. And again, when we look at the incidents from Louise Sun in Canada, one in eight patients had a map of less than 55 for more than five minutes. From the Sal Massey paper, a third of patients had a map of less than 65 for more than 30 minutes. Why mention these random numbers? All these durations and thresholds are associated with harm. And there's lots of it out there. 
There's lots of hypertension and there's lots of levels that impact on patient outcomes. While some of this is avoidable, halving your blood pressure for 10 minutes or more, the only realistic conclusion from that data is we are not treating it. Okay, we have to change. There's lots of talk over the last two days about prehabilitation, exercise, and a large part focused on behaviour change. And it's now time for us to change our behaviour towards hypotension. In our defence, these magic figures of 65 millimetres of mercury have only just come to the forefront in the last two to three years, but we are slow to change about it. The other thing, I think the other reason why we are slow to change, is we don't see the harm. MINS, if you believe in it, AKI, it doesn't happen in theatre. It doesn't happen in the recovery room. It happens at day three or four down the line. We don't have that natural feedback to change our practice, but we have to start realising the harm we are potentially causing. So the first thing we can do is just change. Perhaps the reason we're not treating blood pressure, though, is that you can't treat what you don't measure. (laughs) We measure heart rate continuously, pulse oximetry continuously, you measure blood pressure, how long? I don't know. There is no real guidance. The UK Association says eh, maybe about five minutes would be a reasonable interval. The American Association says roughly about the same. So if we measure every five minutes, we know the blood pressure, the true blood pressure, for a fraction of a second over that period. It's a really small percentage. We're missing a huge amount of monitoring on these patients. And we also use Victorian technology. Oscillometric techniques came in the 1860s, 70s, the latter half of, of that century. In our defence, it wasn't automated until the 1980s. It's only taken us 35 years to start to change a wee bit. If we use infrequent measurements and we use this non-continuous monitoring, this is what we see. This is from one of our necathema trial patients. So the patient has a clear sight cuff on. The clinician's blinded to it. They just have a normal cuff. And we see a very similar pattern in almost all the patients. The cuff goes up, we're hypotensive. We give a little bit of vasopressor. A couple of minutes later, we're hypotensive again. A couple more minutes later, the cuff goes up again. This time, we're hypotensive. So it cycles again. Oh, can't detect it. It cycles again. We finally detect hypotension and we treat it. And this cycle continues and continues and continues. I think the really important thing is, when we talk about duration of hypotension causing harm... It's not as a single episode. It's the cumulative amount of hypertension that causes harm. This magical figure of 13 minutes, it's not one 13-minute episode. It's multiple small episodes of hypertension that add up to that time. So these little bits of hypertension over duration of surgery can lead to AKI and can lead to MINS. But you know, we are slow to change. 1967, Jan Panaz, uh, he was a Czech a physiologist or engineer, I can't quite remember, but he came up with the idea of the finipress. So that's 50 years ago now. But we do now have technology where we can measure blood pressure continuously and also non-invasively as well. And if we do, it's not surprising that we reduce hypotension. This is from Dan Sessler's group once again. He is a sort of... Well, he's Dan Sessler, isn't he? He's a difficult man. <laughs> anyway... He looked at two groups, really simple trial. So on one group of patients, they put on a clear site, they're continuous non-invasive blood pressure cuff, and the other group, just the standard stuff we use every day. I'm not surprised, just by measuring blood pressure, you halve the incidence. The absolute number of patients with hypotension hasn't changed, but the duration of hypotension has been halved. So second thing we can do to reduce blood pressure or reduce hypotension is just measure it properly and measure it continuously. And that way we detect hypertension early and we treat it early as well. I know perhaps now, after the best part of 150 years, it's time to change the way that we look after these patients and how we measure blood pressure. The next problem we have in terms of treating hypertension is just that, we treat it. We live in this somewhat odd state of reactive medicine. Hypotension occurs. At some point after that, we decide to treat it. But remember, it's the cumulative duration of hypotension. Okay, that's an episode. Over the time of surgery, those will add up to thresholds that start to come, uh, start to cause harm. But hypotension doesn't just occur. There is a period of instability that precedes hypotension that we just can't measure with our current technology. 
Now, if we could measure that instability, we could change what we do. We could move from sort of pre- um, sorry, reactive to a proactive state, treating hypertension before it occurs. And there are now algorithms that exist that predict hypertension up to 15 minutes before it actually happens. And it's based on the features of the arterial waveform. Essentially, it detects this instability that precedes the event. And it's been developed through machine learning analysis um, from really quite large data sets. Why the arterial waveform? Well, beyond the obvious, it measures your blood pressure, so it's probably kind of important to relate to the hypertension. It gives us a huge amount of other information. So if we look at systolic rise time, we can talk about contractility. Systolic decay time measures aortic compliance. We can get information on the heart rate, on pulse pressure variation, stroke volume variation. Overall, you can extract around about 160 different features from an arterial waveform. But static measurements don't really tell us very much at all. They have almost no predictive ability. What we can do is look at interactions and the variability and the complexity of these signals. And they are much more predictive of hypotension. When we talk about variability, um, heart rate, for example, your heart rate's 60. Mine's probably about 80. But it's not 80. It's 78 one minute. It's 80 the next. It's 82. The average of it is 80. As we approach instability, we lose that variability, not just in heart rate, but in our blood pressure variation, our stroke volume variation, our cardiac output variation. And we can measure this. Complexity also changes as we become unstable. And we've all seen it. You know, when we have sick patients, that arterial waveform is just quite ill-defined. We lose that dichotic notch. And we can quantify that through frequency distribution and through entropy. And we can look at how all these things work together. Look at that baroreceptor reflex. And when we put all this together, what we can do is we can find roundabouts. Or what we do first of all, we have 3,000 features we now can define from this waveform. We do an analysis, we take the best 50 or 60 predictive values, and then we do what's called combinatorial features. So you multiply them all together at different powers, and that assesses non-linearity. And that's quite important in detecting some extremes of measurement. But what you get in terms of what is delivered is you can identify 2.5 million features per waveform. You then apply that to 150 million different waveforms, multiply those together, that's a lot of data and sort of four to the power of I don't know, 10 to 19 or something. And what you get is a measure. You analyze it, you come down, and you can identify 23 of the most predictive features of impending hypotension. The question is, though, what does it do? It just gives you a number. Okay? That number goes from 0 to 100, but it's quite a clever number. The higher the number, the more likely you are to be hypotensive. And the shorter the time frames that are occurring, the lower the number, the less likely you are to be hypertensive. And if it does occur, it will occur at some point into the future. So this is data from, um, some, well, from our hospital and from a Thomas Shereen in Groningen. So it's 260 patients. Um, they've all had gold-directed fluid therapy, and they've all had HPI put on, but not treated with it. So you can see here, if your HPI is between 20 and 29, then your chance of being hypertensive is about 30%. And if you do go on to be hypertensive, that's about nine minutes in the future. You compare that to, say, it's 90 to 99, almost everybody will be hypertensive, and it will happen quickly, in around about two minutes or so. And this is really the premise of, of maybe how we can predict and treat hypertension. This is from an open anterior resection. The black line is HPI, the red line on mean arterial pressure. There's a magic cutoff for, for HPI about 85, but that happens around about here, We cross the threshold, but we don't get hypotension for seven minutes. The premise behind it, in that time, we should be able to identify the cause of that instability and treat it appropriately, and hence avoid hypotension. Does it work, though? And is it, more importantly, any better than what we measure at the moment? It has to have some form of incremental value. Same data set. There's around about a quarter of a million data points in this analysis, uh, it's bootstrap analysis, 2,000 iterations. You can see there that area of the curve for HPI is pretty good. Okay. As we get further away from the event, away from hypertension, then we start to lose predictive ability. But that's to be expected. It's a bit like, as Monty often says, it's looking at the weather. Pop your head out now, you can tell whether you need an umbrella or not. Will you need an umbrella in half an hour or an hour's time? You don't know. You're less certain. That predictive ability falls away. 
The important thing, though, look at the area under the curve for changes in mean arterial pressure for detecting hypertension. It's almost as good as flipping a coin. And it doesn't really matter what you measure. You can look at change in the mean arterial pressure, change in the stroke volume, any hemodynamic parameter that we measure, none of them predict hypotension occurring. And that kind of makes sense because they're all one-dimensional. We're focusing on one thing, whereas the algorithm focuses on 26 things all combined together. And many of those are combinatorial factors. They have other factors rolled into it as well. So the third thing we can do is use particular technology to preempt hypotension's occurrence and treat it before it happens. Slight change of track. This is a, a study one of my colleagues and I did a number of years ago. Crystal of the colloid in patients having surgery. No difference in outcome. Last year, from uh, Alexander Houston, crystal of the colloid in patients having major surgery. This time, they showed a reduction in complications. Very, very similar trials. Very different outcomes. Now, there are many reasons why it might be different, but maybe who is delivering the protocol. One has a human factor, and one's closed-loop systems. And we now start to see closed-loop systems uh, in looking at vasopressor control. This is in the porcine model. So the blue ones here are our control um, subjects, and we change blood pressure by changing sodium nitroprusside at drips. This is the active group here. So blood pressure is trying to be changed by changing this vasodilator, but the closed-loop system controls the vasopressor infusion and keeps it relatively constant. Very little variation. And we're now seeing it being used in humans as well. It's a very simple system. It's just a computer program. It slaves in an arterial waveform. The computer program controls a syringe. In this case, it's a peripheral noradrenaline. And it assesses the response, so the pharmacodynamic response to individuals, and titrates the dose occasionally, or respectively. We think we're better than machines time and time again, but every time we put ourselves up against them, we're not. We can see there, when we do manual titration, that's in the ICU patients, we spend time in target, about half, 50%, we have the right blood pressure or the blood pressure we're aiming for. With closed-loop systems, the time in target's around about 95%. Again, ICU patients, but the reason that closed-loop or automated technology is much better than us is because of this predominantly. It's making about 170 changes per hour to that infusion rate. Now, we can't do that. We can't comprehend it. We can't see this minutiae. And we also have plenty of other things to do. So perhaps one of the ways to avoid hypertension is to offload that burden to closed-loop system and allow it to manage it for us. Set it a target and then sit back and let the computers do the work. Last subject, we can avoid hypertension using those methods. But what about treating it? Because not all hypertension is avoidable. We have a relatively sparse amount of information in terms of the best way to treat the underlying cause of hypertension, but also to know whether the therapy we're about to employ is going to be successful. And here's a sort of common example. Patient's hypotensive. We know the preload dependent, the SPV is raised. We give them some fluids. We increase the stroke volume. But what does that do to blood pressure? We have absolutely no idea, because that depends on something else. It depends on elastance. Now, elastance we can uh, define from pressure volume loops, the end diastolic points divided by your end systolic points. And so technically, it's your end systolic pressure divided by your stroke volume. If you want, you can calculate it. End systolic pressure is 0.9 times uh, your systolic blood pressure, and we can measure stroke volume from our monitors. But we're not going to do that. It's just impractical. We kind of have a new parameter that's sort of come to the forefront now called dynamic arterial elastance. It's the ratio of your pulse pressure variation divided by your stroke volume variation. Now, I'm not sure what dynamic arterial elastance is. Um, it's not elastance. It's not afterload. It's a made-up number. It's a ratio of, of two parameters. But we have an idea of what it does do. Okay. EA Dyn tells us that if we are a preload responder, so if we're fluid responsive, will we or will we not increase our blood pressure? So if we draw a sort of pressure volume loop for a, you know, a preset um, artery, if we look at the ratio of change in volume to change in pressure, it gives us a huge amount of information. 
So here's a change in volume. That's all straight volume variation is, a change in volume over time. Time is that respiratory cycle. If that change in volume doesn't lead to a change in pressure, then our EA dyne is low. Remember, it's PPV over SPV. So in that individual, yes, they need fluid because their stroke volume variation is raised. They are a fluid responder in terms of flow, but that increase in flow won't lead to an increase in pressure. So when your EA dyne is low, giving fluid, you won't increase your mean arterial pressure. Conversely, same change in volume, SVV, if that leads to a large change in pulse pressure variation, the ratio is high. So PPV over SVV, this time it's high, it's over one. In that individual, when you give them fluid, you'll improve flow because your SVV is raised, and that will lead to an increase in blood pressure as well. So all it is, it's a... EA dyne is a bit like it's the stroke volume variation of the pressure world. It's a number that tells us, will my patients increase the blood pressure if I give them some fluid? And that's actually quite a useful parameter for us as neatists. How many times do we see patients who are hypotensive? We give the fluid and nothing happens. The underlying cause is different. That's an unnecessary intervention. Give them fluid for no reason. This helps rationalise our decisions. So really, just to round up, if we measure blood pressure properly we can reduce hypertension. And if we can predict it, we might be able to avoid it. And we need additional information, such as EA dyne, such as contractility, to help decide the best way to treat underlying hypertension. But ultimately, the best way to treat hypertension may be to take it out of our hands and automate it by closed-loop systems. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Top Bed Talk. Nick Majerison here. Have you got yourself onto edpom.org yet? If not, you might not be aware, Edpom Chicago. Tickets are free for a limited period only. Go now to edpom.org. Evidence-based perioperative medicine. edpom.org.